I'm Herminia Ibarra, faculty chair of the INSET Leadership Initiative, and I have with me Michael Hogg, professor of social psychology at Claremont Graduate University. Michael's an expert on social identity and intergroup relations. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Michael, you've been an observer, uh, both historically but also in terms of present day, of a whole range of situations that call for what you call intergroup leadership. Can you say a little bit more about what is intergroup leadership and what are some of the examples that really make it such a pressing idea? Well, I guess at the moment, I mean, the there's two very obvious examples of intergroup leadership. The one I, I suppose most of us think about is, is Iraq. Um, you've got three groups. You've got Sunni, Shiite and um, Kurds in the north. Um, and someone has to lead this nation. And so leadership there isn't just a matter of trying to provide a focus for a, for a collection of individuals. It's trying to provide a vision that kind of transcends these very, very deep differences between groups. I mean, so that I think is one of the most vivid ones. Uh, there are countless examples. Um, the other example that comes to mind again, very contemporary, is the presidential race in the United States, where the various contenders are trying to draw to their side different groups. You know, um, African Americans, Latinos, um, women, um, the working class, and so forth. And so I think if you look through history in, in any contemporary kinds of situations, particularly in the realm of public leadership, where people lead nations and provide a focus for religions and ethnic groups, really these, are, these leadership situations are very much trying to transcend group differences in order to provide a unifying theme, a unifying identity um, for the people to get behind. You're a social psychologist and one of the things that you have stated is that the study of leadership has traditionally ignored a whole range of things having to do with the identity function of leadership. Can you say more about that and in particular how social psychology can inform the way that we think about leadership in a whole array of different spheres? Maybe ignored is maybe too strong, more un underplayed it. I think a lot of the most um, the most obvious leadership research that, that's around nowadays and has been for a number of years comes out of um, um, the organizational sciences, uh, management and so forth. The focus is very much in organizations, um, on the CEO, um, and the whole area of public leadership, presidents and so forth, seems to be an area of research which doesn't draw in so much psychology. Um, it seems to come in from political science. And I think a lot of the organizational leadership looks at leadership effectiveness, getting the task done, selling products. It doesn't focus so much upon identity, on how um, working for a firm, uh, being part of an organization, is, is part of who you are. Often when you meet someone for the first time, after you ask them their name, they say, you know, what's your profession? What's your job? So, so organizations also provide an identity function. People identify with organizations. They take away from it a sense of who they are. And I just think that the organizational literature doesn't um, research that as much as perhaps it could. Now, if you're coming from social psychology, I think we're in a really good position as social psychologists to be able to contribute and perhaps change the balance. And one of the reasons for that is social psychologists tend to look at uh, particularly those who research on collective identity, group identity, tend to look at how large social categories, you know, ethnic groups, racial groups, gender groups, nations and so forth, religions, how these provide a really, really important sense of who you are. So you have here a whole literature from psychology and social psychology that studies the formation and function of identity, of social identity, of group identity. And it's only a short step to be able to take that across to organizations. But what we hadn't done in social psychology, in this sort of social identity tradition, is look at how leaders or how certain people in groups um, provide the focus, and they're the sort of, yeah, provide the focus for, uh, and the mechanism for people to define themselves. And so I think that's why social psychology has a whole enormous literature now on identity, social identity, intergroup relations, um, that I think can help um, in the whole leadership area, not just organizational leadership, management leadership, but public leadership. So, so from your work, what would you say it takes to provide effective leadership in an intergroup situation? And if here, if we can make a bridge from, say, from Iraq to an organization that's, or two organizations that are going through a merger, or an organization that may have a good bit of interfunctional conflict, or a leader who has come up to the marketing ranks and now must be a general manager in a way that unites different groups, a company faced with um, a diversity initiative and not managing to somehow bring together people of different 
genders, racial groups, national cultures. What does your perspective say to that in a very practical way? In social psychology, there's a lot of research on how you can improve relations between groups. So you've got these different groups within an overarching group. Um, there's a lot of research on this. None of it really specifies what a leader needs to do, but we do have some principles of how you can get those groups to get on better together. Um, and there are a number of issues here. I mean, one problem is that if we take the merger, all right, you've got two organizations, well, it's usually an acquisition, one's taken over the other. Um, what you've got is you've got two quite separate traditions, cultures, and identities in the same organization now. Um, so typically what's going to happen there is each group, each subgroup, each previous organization feels very threatened. It feels that its whole identity and sense of self is going to be absorbed into this amorphous identity. They feel a threat, an identity threat. So one of the things leaders need to do in those situations is somehow disarm that identity threat. To, um, and there's a term that's used, I think it's by um, Sam Gettner and Jack DeVideo, to do with um, different groups or different groups playing on the same team. All right? So you have some shared, shared um, visions, some shared identity, but the different groups within it are still distinct. So one of the main challenges, I think, for intergroup leadership, and if you look, use the example of the mergers, is to make sure that the subgroups, the groups that have come in together, don't feel they're just going to vanish. All right, that they're going to be respected, treated as distinct, seen as each contributing something separate to the superordinate identity. The other issue that comes in there is that there's research on um, in-group projection, it's called, by Amelie Mumundi and some of her colleagues, um, which argues that whenever you get situations where you've got different groups, you know, it could be Republicans and Democrats within the United States or two organizations within a superordinate organization, is that what tends to happen is each organization, each subgroup, tends to see the, its own attributes as being better represented in the overall group. However, if one group feels it's somehow subservient to the other, it flips around. So you're in this situation of thinking, my identity is being challenged or I'm being deprived of my identity. My attributes, my practices and my customs aren't properly re represented. And you have this sense of moving away, of not really being part of the overall organization. Well, that's not going to work. As a leader, you can't have that happening. You've got to make sure that the subgroups each see that their own attributes are reflected in the superordinate group. And I think this comes to something which I've always thought is really important in leadership in those situations, is trust. Um, if you trust your leader, chances are you allow the leader to be innovative, to do different things, to, to move an organization, if we use an organization or a nation, in different, in different dimensions. But you're only going to allow a leader to do that if you trust that person. Now, if that leader is seen to come from this dominant subgroup with all the attributes in it, you're not going to trust that person. But so the, I think the, the, the leader typically is a member exactly. of one of those groups, and, exactly. and hence the problem. How exactly. do you deal with that? that that's the challenge. I, I don't know. I mean, I think you know, the, what often happens when you have warring factions trying to resolve problems is you bring in someone from outside who doesn't have any affiliations with the previous organization, so it's a negotiator or a, or a mediator of some sort. So maybe one way to do this is instead of having someone running the new organization, who actually belong to one of the former organizations is bring someone in from outside who's equally non, and we use the term prototypical, non-typical, non non-representative of the two sub-organizations. A neutral outsider as, as, as leader. Yeah, um, uh, yes, a clean slate, someone brought in a new CEO from, from outside, not placed in the CEO position, the person, one of the members of the two subgroups. I mean, that would be one way to deal, perhaps, help deal with that, that, that issue to some extent. It's a challenge. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you.